Right. Can you all see that? Uh, yes, it's uh, perfect. Good. Okay. Um, so, uh, we like that, um, high performance balancing on an arrow support. But first, I want to show you a video that I prepared because I want to show you some fast motions that can only be seen at a high frame rate. So if you go to the chat, you'll find an announcement for this file here, which you can download with a single click. If you're not using Zoom, you can type in this URL and get it directly off the internet. And um, there's also a, a streaming option, I believe, for those who are streaming in China. Um, I don't know how that works, but maybe you do. So this, this video is about six minutes long. I'd like you to download it, view it at the high frame rate, and then return to this slideshow. In the meantime, I will show the same video over the Zoom flat platform, but mute it so that the audio doesn't interfere. Um, that's for the benefit of anyone who arrives too late to hear these instructions and wonders why nothing is happening. So please do that now. I will, I will do the same, and then I'll wait 20 seconds or so for you to return to the slideshow. This is a 3D balancing machine. It has five revolute joints, therefore five degrees of motion freedom. The two joints at the top are actuated, while the three at the bottom form a passive spherical joint which models a point contact between the yellow link and the ground. The machine is balancing itself in 3D while simultaneously following a motion command that specifies the bend angle between the yellow and green links and the heading of the robot. So the machine is both underactuated and overloaded in the sense that there are more task variables than controls. Five motion freedoms, two actuators and four task variables. Two for the motion command and two to balance the robot. We call this method of balancing bend swivel control. It works by breaking the task of balancing in 3D into two subtasks, balancing in the vertical plane and keeping that plane vertical. In this case, the bend joint balances the robot in its sagittal plane, while the other joint, which spins the three-arm crossbar, keeps the sagittal plane vertical and controls the heading of the robot. We will be implementing this control system on Skippy once it is built and operational. This animation shows a planar robot balancing on a knife edge in a vertical plane. It has three actuated degrees of freedom and four in total. The purpose of this animation is to show how the balance controller works in combination with a separate motion controller. In this case, only one motion freedom is needed to balance the robot, but there are three actuated freedoms available. So one motion freedom is used both to balance the robot and to follow a motion command, while the other two are under pure motion control. Most of the time, it's the bottom joint, the one between the red and orange links, that is used to balance the robot. But there is one point in the animation where the task is distributed around the other joints. This next animation shows a simple planar double pendulum balancing in a vertical plane and following motion commands. Only the upper joint is actuated. This animation demonstrates the technique of leaning in anticipation of the balance disturbance 
that will be caused by future commanded motions. When the robot leans in anticipation, it improves the tracking accuracy of the controller. This robot executes one sequence of motion commands without leaning in anticipation, and then another with. The first sequence, without leaning in anticipation, starts now. The second sequence, with leaning in anticipation, starts now. And you can see the robot starting to fall just before each movement. In this next animation, we are back to combining the balance controller with a separate motion controller. However, this time the quantity under motion control is the absolute orientation of the upper link, which depends not only on the angles of the two actuated joints, but also on the angle of the bottom link about the knife edge, which is the passive motion freedom over which the controller does not have direct control. The ability to balance while making controlled absolute motions is necessary if the robot wants to interact physically with objects in its environment. This next animation shows our most recent work, which hasn't been published yet. One of my students is looking into what happens when we combine the balance controller with a passive spring-loaded joint. In this case, the robot is a planar double pendulum with a springy leg to help it jump high, but which interferes significantly with balancing motion while the robot is on the ground. As you can see, the robot is still able to balance and track motion commands in spite of the disturbances caused by the springy leg, which includes slipping and loss of contact between the foot and the ground. Furthermore, the balance controller is also acting to damp down the vibrations caused by the spring. So this is a particularly extreme example of overloading. With just one actuator, the control system is balancing the robot, tracking a motion command and damping oscillations. And finally, here is a video of a real robot executing our balance controller just to prove that it works in reality as well as in simulation. Look closely and you can see it leaning in anticipation. And at the end you can see it resisting large disturbances. Okay, I think that's uh, enough waiting time. Um, the video hasn't quite finished yet. Um, well, you can, you can watch it again later. I hope you enjoyed that video. And let's now explain what it was that, that you saw and how I achieved it. The topic of the talk is balancing on a narrow support. And why do I phrase it like that? Well, here are two humanoid robots. The one on the right is standing on a, um, a flat platform and therefore has a substantial polygon of support. The one on the left is standing on a convex surface. And well, in a rigid body world, that would it would be a contact, but the size of the area would be so small that it is effective. Roy, we don't hear you very well. Maybe you can be near the mic, probably, if possible. Um, can you repeat, please?
Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, I can hear you again. Uh, basically, the internet connection okay. was not very good. So, yeah. Could you please? Okay, uh, I will continue now. Mm -hmm. So, the robot on the right is effectively a fixed based robot. It is statically stable as long as the ground reaction force stays inside the support polygon. So this robot could be controlled with a position controller, provided only that you've been careful to plan the motions um, so that the uh, zero moment point stays inside the support polygon. But on the left, however, is dynamically unstable. It must balance actively at all times. So it is continually in a state of motion. And if this robot stops moving, then it falls over. But I'm also interested in high performance. So what do I mean by high performance balancing? Well, in the Skippy project, we define it like this, a robot, is a high performance balancer if it can accurately follow commands to make large, fast movements without losing its balance, and it can quickly recover from large balance disturbances. So we're interested both in high speed and large movements, large disturbances. And our approach to this, this um, activity has been to study the physics of balancing, because balancing is a physical activity and not just a control theory exercise. Um, the relatively small amount of literature that we found on balancing, uh, it all treats it as a control theory exercise. Incidentally, if you look, you find there's far, far more papers on the, um, the problem of swing up control than there is on the problem of actually balancing once you've successfully swung up. Um, and the other aspect of our approach is to study the robot itself, not the control system, because the robot's physical ability to balance is the property of the robot itself, not the control system. So we look at the robot, we find out what makes a robot physically good at balancing, and we design our robots to be good at balancing. All of the little the example machines that you saw in the video they're all good at balancing because they were designed that way. They, their, um, um, their speed, their pressure distribution, and their link lengths, they're all, they were all designed to be good at balancing. Now, how do we balance on a point? Well, this activity requires manipulation of the gravity moment about the support point. And you do that by moving the center of mass relative to the support. So if we imagine the complete system to consist of a balance controller and a robot, what the balance controller is doing is it's sending self-motion commands to the robot. In other words, motion commands for the actuated joints in the robot, the motions that the robot can control directly. And it's monitoring the resulting change 
in the motion of the center of mass. So the balance controller doesn't care where your arms and legs are, but it does care where your center of mass is relative to the support. So this is the system. And if you think of balancing as a system like this, it becomes clear that from the balance controller's point of view, the robot is a plant with inputs of self motion commands and an output of center of mass motion. And a robot will be physically good at balancing if relatively small self motion causes a relatively large center of mass motion. This means that relatively little movement is required first to achieve and then to maintain the robot's balance. So here's an example comparing a good balancer with a bad balancer. If we have a machine that's initially balanced but is subjected to an external disturbance, if it's a good balancer, relatively small movement is enough to correct the disturbance and then the robot recovers its balance and it's back to a nice balanced configuration. If we apply the same disturbance to a robot that is physically bad at balancing, then the robot needs to make a much bigger response and if that response hits a motion limit, either a position or a velocity limit, then it fails to fully respond to the disturbance. So there is still some residual balance error that cannot be corrected. And so the robot falls over. And this thinking leads to the idea of velocity gain, which is literally the gain of the plant. If you think of actuated joint motion as input and center of mass motion as output. Specifically, it's defined to be the um, ratio of a change in center of mass velocity to a change in actuated joint velocity where both changes were caused by an impulse at the actuated joint. Now we have already analyzed the dynamics of balancing, treating it as a physical it can be expressed as a single differential equation, which can be written down as a block diagram, this block diagram. And this is a description of the physical balancing um, activity of the robot. This, this describes the plant, and therefore it can serve as the plant to be used by the balance controller. This is another area where we differ from previous works. Um, in, in the literature, you find people who've studied balancing of robots have tried to design a machine that balances every aspect of the robot. So they're using the complete dynamic description of the robot. We are not doing this. We have extracted from the robot's dynamics, just the one item that is relevant to balancing. So this is the plant. This portion of the plant is concerned with balancing, while this little portion here feeds in the disturbances caused by other motions. In other words, we have two control systems running simultaneously. The balance controller, which balances the robot, and a separate motion controller, which 
controls all other aspects of the robot's behavior. So we've separated the two concerns. Balancing is treated by one control system. Doing everything else is treated by the other control system, which I won't be talking about here. So let's look at these variables. Variable L, the angular not the center of mass. That's important because the activity of balancing requires you to manipulate the gravity note about the support point. So that's L, L dot, L double dot, L triple dot are its time derivatives. Q1 is the variable describing the robot's motion relative to the ground. So this is the lean angle of the robot. It's the unactuated degree of freedom, which makes the robot as a whole underactuated. The robot can measure this variable, but it has no way to control it directly. Q2 is the variable that's going to be used both to balance the robot and to follow motion commands. So this variable is overloaded because there are more task objectives than there are controls. And finally, all the other robot variables. Um, now, these could all be joint variables, or they could be variables in an operational space. The same applies to Q2. It could be a, a single joint that's used to balance, or it could be a virtual joint or a degree of freedom in an operational space. These two gains, Y1 and Y2, provide a complete and exact description of the robot's physical balancing behavior. Now, if they were constants, then this plant would be beautifully linear, but unfortunately, they do vary with configuration. So they're functions of Q1, Q2, and Q3. Um, however, they do not vary very quickly, and they do not vary over a large range of values. So even though this plant is non-linear in reality, if we make a linearity assumption when we are designing the control system, we still get good results. And Y1 and Y2 turn out to be easily measured functions of two, or easily calculated functions of two easily measured physical properties of the robot. It's natural time constant toppling, which is the rate at which the robot begins to fall, treating it as a single rigid body, and the linear velocity gain of Q2 dot, which means the velocity gain of the plant treating Q2 dot, or rather Q2, as the variable that's going to be used to balance the robot. So this is the ratio of a step change in velocity where it should say horizontal velocity of the center of mass caused by a unit step change in the velocity Q2 dot. If you're balancing in 2D in a vertical plane, because you're balancing on a knife edge, then all these signals in the plant are scalars. If instead you're balancing in full 3D, then these signals are all 2D vectors because you have 
two angles you need to balance simultaneously in two directions in order to be balanced in full 3D. And that implies that Y1 and Y2 would be two by two matrices. Y3, on the other hand, is a rectangular matrix with, with a size that depends on how many other degrees of freedom there are in the robot. So how do we achieve high performance balancing? We simply close the control system around this plant. That's all there is to it, really. But we can do even better if we apply an, a causal filter to the command input that implements leaning in anticipation of the balanced disturbances that will be caused by commanded future motions. The idea here is that the robot's high-level controller knows what movements it intends to make in the immediate future. And so this information can be used now to prepare the robot for those future motions. This is what human beings do. If you are going to open a heavy door and you know that the door is heavy, and so a large force is required, then what do you do? You lean backwards slightly before you start to pull. You lean in anticipation of the disturbance that the large pulling force will have on your balance. So how does this a causal filter work? Well, Firstly, we have to decide what it's going to do. And the answer is, it's a simple first order filter running backwards in time from a point sufficiently far in the future to the present. And here's a slide showing you a comparison between a normal filter and this a causal filter. Looking at this graph first, imagine that the green signal is the input to the filter and the purple signal is the output. And the filter itself is a very simple, linear, first order low pass filter with uh, the time constant of toppling here as the, uh, the cutoff frequency of the, of the filter. That's important. The filter must match the natural rate of toppling of the robot. So what happens as time moves from left to right, where you see this step here, the output of the filter immediately starts moving towards the new constant value. And again here, and where you have the ramp, it starts to follow the ramp, but with a bit of a time delay. In the second graph here, you see really the same thing, but with time going from right to left. So if you imagine time starting here and proceeding in this direction, you see the same behavior. First thing that happens is the ramp, and the filter follows the ramp with a time delay. But a time delay in reverse time is a time lead in forward time. And where the steps occur, it um, starts to converge exponentially to the new constant value, and again here. So the purple line is now implementing this filter in forward time, in if, or rather effectively this filter in forward time, but we can't do this literally in forward time because this is an unstable pole. That's why we have to calculate this filter in reverse time. So what effect does the filter have? Well, these two graphs, 
show the response of the robot with and without the filter. First, without the acausal filter, again, the green signal is the original command. This is what we want the robot to do. And the red signal here is the robot's response to that command. And we find that as soon as the command changes, the robot immediately moves in the opposite direction briefly before moving in the correct direction and converging to the new value. And you see the same thing again with the ramp. As soon as the ramp starts, the robot immediately moves in the opposite direction. Then it follows the ramp with a time delay. And when the ramp stops, instead of stopping, the robot accelerates. So it does again the opposite of what the command signal does. It overshoots a little bit and then converges to the new value. This is typical non-minimum phase response and it's a part of the physics of balancing. This has to happen. It is a physical necessity and no control system can fix it. However, for the special case, you have advanced knowledge of the command signal, at least for a second or two, so that you can pass it through this A course or filter. You, you can perform this clever trick. Instead of giving the green signal to the control system, you give it the purple signal. And what happens is that the uh, robot leans an extremely small amount here in anticipation of this sudden change in the command signal. And because it's tipped itself very slightly off balance, it continues to fall, but it's been judged just right so that when it's time to make this movement, it recovers its balance at the same time as making the movement. So the movement is very fast and there is no moving in the wrong direction here. It immediately makes the correct movement. And the same thing happens with the ramp and it follows the ramp with a much smaller time delay. So although non-minimum phase response is a physical property of balancing, we can compensate it when we know in advance what the motions are going to be. So if you have an unexpected disturbance, you're back to this response because the robot didn't know it was going to happen. So here's the balance control law that we use. It's a very simple linear feedback control law. Um, it's full state feedback, but specifically on this plant. So one of the things that has to be done is you have to perform a um, change of state variables to extract from the robot's state variables these new set of state variables, L, L dot, L double dot, and Q2. But it also makes use of this a causal filter. So if I explain what we have here, the red underlined quantities of the feedback gains, which we set using pole placement. AF stands for the A causal filter. U is the input signal to the controller. It's composed of the original command signal plus a linear combination of its first and second time derivatives. And these two feed forward gains manufacture two zeros that go into the um, transfer function, which we contrive to cancel with two of the poles. And finally, um, here are some experimental results. These results apply specifically to the video you saw at the, saw at the end, 
with the uh, the robot spinning its um, its reaction wheel and performing a series of movements consisting of ramps and sine waves. So in this graph, the gray signal, which is not very easy to see, but you can see it here, you can get another view of it here. The, the gray signal is the original command signal. This is what we wanted the robot to do. The black signal here, QF, is the result of passing the gray signal through the causal filter. So the black signal is the input to the controller. The blue signal, Q2, is the response of the robot. And this is the real response. So you can see a few wiggles. There's a wiggle here and another one here and another one here, so it's not perfect. There's also a bit of a, a wiggle here at the end of the sine wave. But this dashed line, QT, again, not very easy to see, this is the theoretical response that we designed the, the control system to achieve. So this is what the response would have been if the plant had really been linear. So the difference between the dashed blue and the solid blue shows you how close we got to a linear response. And you can see we did get very, very close. Finally, the green signal is the lean angle the robot. So this is the unactuated degree of freedom multiplied by 10 so you can see it on the same scale. And you can see here the robot leaning in anticipation. The lean angle is building before the start of this first ramp and it's built to such an extent that when the robot suddenly makes this large fast movement it pushes the robot over from this positive lean angle to this negative lean angle, but the robot is still, it still has um, linear momentum in the same direction. So what happens now is it's falling back up to a balanced configuration, but it doesn't quite make it. It starts to fall again, but this, in, this time it's leaning in anticipation of the next large ramp motion. And this is how it continues. And this is what it looks like leaning in anticipation when you see it on a graph. Okay, so that's my book. That's the end. Thank you for your attention. For more information, look at this website. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Roy, for the great presentation. Um, you are right in time. So, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, if not yet, uh, may I ask a, ask you a question, Roy? Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes. So basically, mm, I have the impression that uh, from the very beginning of the, your, your talk, basically you claim that the uh, balance is a property of the robot itself, but not the control system. Uh, whereas uh, in the rest of the mm, uh, presentation, basically we are talking about how to design feed forward uh, filter, how to uh, uh, design the control system. So do you think that, uh, for instance, the uh, block diagram showing, uh, for instance, page eight could be applied on existing uh, humanoid robots? Yes, of course. Um, what I said was that the robot's physical ability to balance is a property of the robot itself. Of course, you need a control system to make the robot balance. And without the control system, the robot cannot balance. 
but the control system is constrained by the physical properties of the robot. If the robot physically cannot balance, then the balance controller will not succeed. And that's why we, we study the plant, because we want to get high performance balancing. So we want to get close to the physical limits of the robot. And so we need to study the robot to find out what determines its physical limits. But the control system will apply to any existing robot that is physically capable of balancing. Um, it would apply to an iCub, for example, if the iCub were standing on that hump that you saw at the beginning, but the iCub would be um, very uh, would be a very unstable because it's uh, wobbly and slow, and so only a very small disturbance would be enough to make it lose its balance. But it would still the, the theory still applies. Okay, thank you very much for for your answer. It helps. It, it can greatly help with my understanding. <laughs>